So how did a nice boy like you become a socialist? I mean, tell us a little about your background. You, I mean, I've heard that you grew up playing basketball and idolizing Michael Jordan and watching no, 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 80s not, not, movies. Wait, wait, not Michael Jordan, John Starks, maybe the losers of history. John, the, losers the losers of the NBA of in the 90s, history. the Knicks. You John know, Starks uh, is the German yeah. Revolution and... Of course, <laughs> okay, uh, great. at best. <laughs> Um, so, well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is only my second time in Seattle. Uh, both days, uh, both my trips to Seattle have been like sunny and warm, so maybe I'm getting the wrong impression, but it seems like a great place. Um, so for me, I became a, a socialist, I guess, first by being, at least in my mind, a good, um, committed uh, liberal in the best sense of the, the word in that I'm the youngest of five. I'm the only one in my, my family born in the United States. My family came to the U.S. a few months before I was born. Uh, so I had access to, uh, by virtue of them you know, renting into a suburb with a good public school, I had access to public goods uh, that, were, that were of high quality, you know, good education. I had um, like a library to go to after school, and after school activities that were funded by the state for when parents were working late. Um, you know, things like that, because of course in the U.S. we do have little doses of social democracy, but it's exclusionary and funded primarily through, uh, through property taxes. And um, yeah, I guess I saw how much of life is, were accidents of birth. My three oldest, older siblings didn't go to college. It was very clear they were put on a different route. Um, not necessarily a bad intent, but kind of, oh, it makes more sense to make some money right away, do this trade or, you know, whatever. Um, so I guess if you see the disparities between your life outcomes and people in the same household as you, you know, my siblings were about uh, quite a bit older than me. I was born in 89 and they were, I guess, 73, 74, and 76. Um, you know, either you're a sociopath and you think there's something special about you or you just realize that it's, it's a result of the environment. Um, so I was committed to, I guess, uh, the welfare state, uh, around the same time, uh, when I was, I guess, in, in middle school, uh, it was uh, seventh grade, it was uh, September 11th, and the anti-war movement um, arose. Uh, so it was this mix of kind of this organic politicization um, with just the randomness of picking up and reading um, Marxist works. Um, and I read the Isaac Deutscher trilogy of Trotsky when I was in like eighth grade, which is a bizarre thing to do when you're in eighth grade. Um, I read Ralph Miliband, Michael Harrington, Irving Howe, these other, um, other thinkers. Um, I read, um, I, I kind of skimmed capital. I read the, the only useful chapters, you know, the working day chapter, and you know, I read the vulgar Marxist chapters that were easy to comprehend. I skipped the very complicated uh, early couple chapters. Um, so I guess eventually I kind of merged the two into the politics I have now, which is a, a radicalism uh, that appreciates, I guess, how profound, how important the gains of reforms can be, and a <clears throat> Marxism that doesn't counterpose itself to the gains of, of, of these, uh, these reforms. And I, I joined the Democratic Socialists of America when I was 17. At the time, there was about 5,000 members. Um, it was mostly people over the age of... 60, 65, or under the age of 25. So there was a big donut hole. Um, but those of us under the age of 25 got lots of, lots of attention. Uh, some of them were the only adults I knew that could you know, pay for a dinner. So it was good to go to these guys' <laughs> meetings. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was my, my early politicization. And so it was a mix of, you know, I could create a narrative where I could talk about some anti-war organizing or some some student labor organizing or things like that, but it was really just much more eclectic and random. And I think that's true of a lot of people of my generation. A generation was getting politicized and the left was utterly defeated. You couldn't just plug in 10 million things. Or even now, I think if you're young and you become a socialist, two, three weeks later, you could be at a DSA meeting. Uh, there, it just took a lot more effort and see more. You were piecing together little different threads of ideas and thoughts and, and trying to kind of you know, connect with things. That's interesting. I like your description of sociopathy. If you, if you think, I deserve this stuff, that's called meritocracy. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is everybody deserves it, which is what you thought. You know, gee, this is great. Everybody should have schools, medical care, and live like this. So yeah, I like yeah. that approach, yeah. Um, and then you went to George Washington, uh, 
And at some point afterwards, you founded a new magazine called Jacobin. Yeah, I actually founded it when I was an undergraduate. Were you in uh, there, right? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. So, I mean, that was just through an excess of, of having, like, I, I worked throughout high school and other times, but I was on a scholarship and I, uh, you know, were, used some of, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of money meant for my books to, to start a radical uh, so, so let's go, go back for a second. Yeah. So what is the landscape like in terms of publication? What are radicals reading when you started Jacobin? And what did you think this new magazine could provide that the others weren't providing? So, so I was the briefly the editor of an online publication that was affiliated with uh, Young Democratic Socialists, which today is the Young Democratic Socialists of, of America. Um, and uh, so there was that, but we had very few visitors, but we were able to cohere a group of writers, many of whom went on to, to write for, for, for Jacobin. And at the time I was the editor, there are a base of writers who are about 10, 12 years older. So um, like I was maybe the editor when I was 18, and Peter Fraze and others were, uh, who were the original contributors to The Activist uh, then were, were around my age you know, now. Uh, but I, I was able to develop certain skills as far as editing and whatnot. But it seemed like most of the publications of the left were founded of either right before or right after or during the, the new left explosion. Right. So on the older generation of publish, publications, Monthly Review was founded, I believe, in 1949. Dissent was founded in 1953 or 1954. Uh, new Left Review was founded in the late uh, 50s. So it really right. took off in the early 60s. 60s. Yeah. Um, and then there was Socialist Register, which is probably the least known of those bunch of publications, but right. maybe the most influential for, for me. Um, and that was founded around the same, same era by, mm -hmm. by kind of groups in this, this British um, new left. So uh, there was these older publications, and then there was younger publications that were, were not explicitly socialist. Uh, there were publications like In These Times, which I, I thought was quite good, and I still think is quite, quite good. Uh, but it was quite a more left labor right. publication. Uh, and then there were publications like Adbusters, more anti-consumerist, that I guess probably was bigger in the Pacific Northwest than anywhere, um, anywhere else. But uh, for me, I guess my tensions were twofold. One was there's these compelling ideas that were so compelling that I changed the course of my life uh, to pursue these ideas in this politics, except you're coming to these ideas that have inspired so many millions of people over the course of the decades at a time when it seems like there's no one left. So what do they know that you don't know? But more importantly, I think it was almost the, the opposite. If these ideas can be so compelling to people from all these disparate backgrounds that, that the people uh, around the activists, around early Jacobin were, why shouldn't it be compelling to other people? Um, in a way, the common sense, I think, of, of, a, of a young person or even a child that you know, you see homelessness, what's the solution? Why don't we build homes for the homeless? Mm -hmm. like, I, think, I think that common sense kind of gets withered, or withered away by kind of liberal pragmatism that tells you it's more complicated or whatnot. Uh, we really believed in, in the, the essence of the socialist project, the idea that the exploitations and hierarchies of today that seem so natural, uh, the oppressions of today that seem so natural will one day be looked upon as just completely irrational. And we wanted to popularize this message in a way that was comprehensible. So if you don't need to have read Adam Smith to understand The Economist, one shouldn't necessarily have to have read Marx um, or Engels to understand Jacobin. So it was meant as kind of a synthesis and popularizing device. It was also meant as a defense of some of the core ideas of the socialist movement, which is that, sure, we didn't believe in just reciting old dogmas for the sake of reciting old dogmas, but to us, the most working class advance over the last 150 plus years was done through the auspices of trade unions and political parties and the working class organizations that flowed from there and, and activities in civil society that, that flowed from that base. Um, we, many of us come from very diverse backgrounds. We believe in the, the importance of the struggle against, against oppressions of all type, but we think that in order to seriously deal with fighting oppression, uh, one has to ground your struggles in, in class. So in other words, if you want to fight racism in a substantive way, you have to be talking about redistribution. If you're talking about redistribution of wealth and power, you have to be talking about, about, about class. And these things might seem like bana banalities today, but there was a time, at least it felt that way, uh, at least in the, the student life at the time, that this were, these were kind of radical um, deviations from, from kind of a, a norm of like change the world without taking power 
uh, norm of even the late um, uh, 2000s or what do you call aughts? I never have said that word out loud, aughts. Um, so, so we had both goals in mind. One was an intro left goal and one was a more outward goal. I would say we've probably been more successful at being popularizers than making interventions within the left, but you know, the goal is always to widen the, the tent, not just have conversations and, and battles within the you know, tens of thousands of people that identified on the, the socialist left at the time. So an observation from the standpoint of a reader, which is that it seems to me that Jacobin became a gateway drug to the left, as somebody may have said, and it crystallized the kind of left ecosystem around it at various levels in terms of reading. All the other magazines that you talk about seem to exist on their own with their own line. But there is a way in which uh, uh, someone who writes for Jacobin, uh, or you know, you, you get like Sebastian Budgeon, who's doing historical materialism, to be a contributing editor to Jacobin and to pick up stories. And there's a sense where if you want to know more about Marx from something you've read in Jacobin, it sort of points you in the direction to, you know, you can go to mm -hmm. mid-level like Viewpoint or uh, new left reviewer, you can go up to historical materialism, you want to just take it theoretically, or you could stay at the level of activism, you know, and trying to figure out how to instantiate socialism uh, and organize, you know, which uh, there are plenty of suggestions in Jacobin. So it seemed to me that it crystallized a lot of action around it. Yeah, but also the idea was that theory should be simple, because the world is infinitely complex. So if we want to explain the world or try to, like, talk about the complexity of the world, then you wouldn't have a theory, you would just have a list. But what theory is meant to do is take an infinitely complex world and distill a few pertinent facts about it in a, and so to help us better understand the world. Uh, so for example, what does Marxism give us as a framework? It obviously doesn't give us the answer to everything. You know, it can't, uh, as a friend of mine says, it can't explain you know, the sex appeal of blue jeans. Um, I think my friend formulated that thing, that, that line in like the 70s when maybe it was, it sounded less dated, but um, um, and, but but it, and it can't. We shouldn't, for example, use it to teach us about agriculture and genetics. You know that was one thing the Soviet Union, <laughs> right. um, you know, learned. But uh, what it can teach us is about how the spoils of a society are, are distributed, the the pace of of technological change. Yeah, it can teach us a lot of pertinent pertinent things, and I think. Um, by retreating to some of the basics, we were just trying to figure out, you know, uh, relevant things and, and to make them accessible. Because the point of theory is to make the world more comprehensible, not less comprehensible. But once you start, uh, once the left retreated into academia, the new left's retreat into academia, for instance, was useful in that it preserved certain ideas that were besieged in the society as a whole. But eventually, I think it became a liability. And I think through Jacobin, we're part of the march out of academia and back into the, the actual world where we have to take these ideas now, make them comprehensible, vulgarize them, I think, necessarily a bit, but, um, but you know, make them interact with, with, with the world and with, with movements uh, of which some of them exist now, but it's mostly seeds, hopefully, of, of a much broader uh, working class movement. And let me throw in one other, one other factor. I mean, this retreat to academia was a retreat to what's called cultural Marxism or something like that. The role of David Harvey in focusing everybody back to political economy and to reading Marx, I think, was also crucial in, in fertilizing the movement along with Jacobin in terms of, would you say that? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think it was, it was David Harvey, but it was also even people that weren't necessarily Marxists or not necessarily socialists, but I think people like Naomi Klein, if you look at her evolution from where she, she started her initial books, she moved to, to a politics that was a, a, a kind of a class struggle, social democratic politics that, that, that really resonated with, with people who I think otherwise might have uh, just, in other words, she was a starting point for people who were in the anti-globalization kind of, um, or alter-globalization, whatever you want to call it, a circuit. And not saying that was bad, but, but taking them and, and grounding them, I think, in a more, more permanent, uh, lasting, uh, lasting politics. So obviously, we had a lot of uh, forerunners. The thing we tried to do with Jackman ended up being, being successful, partially because uh, of luck, but partially also because we just edited the pieces over and over again, try to make them more comprehensible. We uh -huh. did, the designers of Jackman are probably the best, best part of, of Jackman. And that's about looking serious, looking, you know, I guess, professional and the goal of that not being professional in the kind of a media sense, but the goal of it is to um, 
be a publication that you could hand to a, a friend and, and, and hand to someone who, who has never engaged with these ideas before. Um, and in print and in some of our pieces, we're still very niche. The audience is, is intended for, for the existing left. But we reach in the U.S. around 1.2, actually that's overall. So but we probably reach in the U.S. around 900,000 unique visitors to a million unique visitors every single um, uh, month, sometimes uh, more. And obviously a lot of those people aren't, aren't socialists. Um, and, and what we can give them is a criticism of, of the world and the inequities that exist around us, uh, a vision of a world after capitalism, but more importantly, a way to plug into day-to-day -day struggles to get from, from here to, to there. And that's the one thing that socialists have traditionally been able to give people that other parts of the left that have had very compelling criticisms of the way the world is today, and even in some cases uh, compelling visions of a world after capitalism, uh, haven't been able to, to, to provide. So a lot of your book is about the history of socialism, uh, which some people have looked on as a millstone about one's neck, uh, others look at it as a resource. Uh, as you go through each of these revolutions one by one, we're first starting with Marx and Engels and going through the German Revolution and then uh, to Russia, in Russia and so forth, what do you see that you take out of it that's kind of a usable past? So the, the middle portion of the book, uh, first of all, the book isn't really a manifesto. I should, uh, I, I should. It was actually called Socialism in Our Time, but uh, the marketing department got a hold of it and said, uh, "This book will not sell. How about we call it the Socialist Manifesto: The Case for Radical Politics in the Era of Extreme Inequality?" So when people like are googling inequality, maybe it'll come up. And I'm like, oh. "Well, the logic sounds right." I just said yes on the spot. I didn't really think about it. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a publisher first and a writer second. Um, now, so the, the, the opening part of the book is, is meant to actually give you like a, um, to make the case for socialism rather than just a case against socialism. So it's kind of a thought experiment of um, a day in the life, a of, day in the life of a social citizen, but in that I threw a second person narrative, um, not as a crazy literary effort, but kind of inspired by So take the, us through the day. Take us through yeah, the day. Yeah, sure. So I'm jumping, jumping yeah. ahead, but um, so yeah, inspired by... Um, G.A. Um, Cohen and these, I like, guess, camping trip analogy and these other like, thought experiments, I start with a second person narrative that tries to explain the Marxist theory of exploitation in the workplace, so explain how, how you know, s someone's life is under, under capitalism. In this case, the uh, character is um, bottling classic curry pasta sauce at John Bon Jovi's dad's pasta sauce factory. In fact, John Bon Jovi's dad actually has a, a line of pasta sauce that includes their signature flavor, which is classic curry. So that part isn't, isn't made up. Um, and then I try to explain how a union can, in fact, mitigate some of these abuses, mitigate the extent and scope of exploitation of the workplace, but also how it has limits. Then I try to explain how social democracy could mitigate uh, these things within this, the, the context of a democratic nation state, but also it has limits, uh, profound limits. Then I try to explain what a transition from social democracy to something approximating socialism could look like, and what this feasible socialism could look like, and what a democratic, uh, worker-controlled workplace could look like under socialism. So that, so I kind of start with this, and I actually think it came out pretty well, but I couldn't, people ask me, oh, you should have made the whole book this way. I couldn't, because it would be too hard. <laughs> And uh, I had to fill up a bunch of words because I had already spent my small advance and I, I, couldn't, I could not finish the book. Um, no, honestly, that's how I finished the book. I basically didn't write it for the first year or so that I was under contract and I, I very quickly wrote it. But <laughs> you should buy it first now. Trust me, it's okay. Um, but, but in the middle portions, I turned to some of this history of how, how the origins of capitalism, which draws on uh, Robert Brenner, Ellen Wood, and these other people that have, that have made kind of similar cases, uh, but explaining the origins of capitalism, and how the working class first emerged, how the working class first emerged politically, uh, through the example of the German uh, Social Democratic Party and these other parties of the Second International, what, what dilemmas these parties ran into, uh, why many of them moved to the, to the right, and uh, then I try to explain the divergent outcomes of this, this unified uh, movement from what happened when uh, small groups of socialists took power 
in, in um, less developed countries amid the context of war and civil war, and, and so what happened with the Russian experience, why did that go wrong? Um, what happened with, when social democracy moved to the right and no longer aspired to go beyond capitalism, but instead tried to at best administer doses of socialism within capitalism? And what happened in, uh, in the third world with these, uh, some of these uh, post-national liberation movements? And I use the example of China because that was the one uh, where, where the leadership, at least the Chinese Communist Party, was the most committed to the actual construction of socialism. So what happened when socialism was turned into a vehicle for, for development and modernity um, and the creation of a working class, not necessarily the kind of uh, democratic uh, exercise of power by an existing working class. So obviously I'm a democratic socialist. I come from a certain political tradition, but I wanted to avoid the no true um, Scotsman kind of thing. Because uh, you know the worst conversations I ever have are with libertarians who, you know, you could be talking to them and you could be, well, look, this is unjust. You could be talking about all the bad things in the world, and they might even agree with you. Uh, then at the end of the conversation, they'll say, yeah, you're right, but you know that's not real capitalism. That's crony capitalism, and it's just incredibly frustrating. It's a semantic thing, and to some degree, socialists, especially those broadly from the anti-Stalinist left. Uh, do the same thing, you know. If if it if it happened, if something bad happened, oh, that only happened because it's not socialism, and you only know that it's socialism when it's good, and it fits this kind of platonic idea of what socialism, uh, you know, should be. So, I do have a vision of socialism that I think is radically democratic, that has a free civil society, and so on. So I'm not I'm not disputing that part, but I did want to understand these different trajectories in a way that wasn't moralistic and in a way that it doesn't assume an outcome. They can, so, right. so what lessons can we draw from these different experiences? And I guess you could say that I became, over the course of writing research in this book, more interested in uh, social democracy's relationship to more radical forms of socialism, because I don't necessarily see the social democratic road as a completely different one than, than the a more radical socialist road, I think. Social democracy is kind of uh, well, you're a football fan, uh, kind of getting to the uh, red zone or something. You know, it's uh, we at its peak in a country like Sweden, let's say, in the in the 1970s, you have huge swaths of life decommodified, taken out of the market, enjoyed as social rights. You have a really strong labor movement, and over time, in fact, through the creation of, of these reforms, the movement wasn't like some Leninists thought it would be. It wasn't bought off. In fact, it was radicalized. Um, people uh, who grew up in a society in the 1960s, uh, Swedish workers, started asking for things uh, and had a big strike wave in 67, 68 that was for industrial democracy. It, it, they were fighting for not just bread and butter things, they were fighting for more workplace rights. They were challenging the right of management to manage. So in some of our tellings, especially tellings of the center left, uh, the way they talk about neoliberalism in all cases, they always say, oh, we had a nice compromise after the war, but then capital broke it, and they broke the deal, we want, we want the deal back, you know, wh whatever. Mm -hmm. in, in many cases, in fact, where social democracy went the furthest, it was the working class that broke the deal, because they were asking more radical questions than capitalism could, could handle. Social democracy, in other words, strengthened the bargaining position of the workers. It gave them more rights, it gave them the greater ability to go on strike, to start demanding more and more things. But at the same time, it left the core levers of control in the hands of, of capitalists. So capitalists could always, at the end of the day, say, well, we're gonna wait, we don't want this deal anymore, it's not working for us, you're making inroads into our profitability, we're going to, in small countries, they could threaten capital flight in a country like the United States, they would just threaten, we're going to withhold our investment until the business environment changes. Uh, then if there's a downturn in the business environment, I mean, you have to believe that a lot of these working class people who were once supporting a program of radical reform would then pull back and just want any job back rather than, than, than to see unemployment rise and whatever else. So it's this, it's this anti-democratic blackmail that that we need to deal with. And I think there were potential solutions to this problem that were floated by the left wing of social democracy. It was this left wing that proposed things like the Meidner plan, a wage earner fund in Sweden that would have slowly socialized production over time. It was this left wing that pushed for greater 
industrial democracy, pushing beyond the kind of class compromise that had governed Swedish industrial relations from 1938 to the late 1960s, and asking for more control over non-bread and butter uh, issues. Then, of course, if it was a right wing of social democracy, the uh, kind of third way social democrats, we would later call them, that we very easily and moralistically condemn today because we say, you know, if only Gordon Brown and Stroder and these other people were made of Cerner stuff, if only they were like the social democrats of the 40s and 50s, then there wouldn't have been a rollback. I mean, it just doesn't seem logical. Why would so all of a sudden a, a, a generation of social democratic leaders were all cowards in different countries in different contexts? No, the, the real dilemma that they encountered was that they saw that, that there was a, a real crisis in social democracy. They saw there was real economic troubles, some of it rooted by this internal class struggle, some of it rooted by intensifying internationalization of the economy in the, in the, the 70s, uh, the OPEC shock. There was a lot of different factors uh, that, that played different roles in different contexts. But a lot of these social democrats said, well, we don't know how capital is going to restore profitability, but they say they need more flexibility, which means they need a little bit less regulation, a little bit weaker unions, and maybe a little bit lower taxes. And if we give them these conditions and growth is restored, then we could tax this, this new growth and we could use it to sustain most of our welfare state. This was the gamble of the third way, the right wing of social democracy. And in many countries, in many ways, it kind of paid off. They, they had a solution to the crisis. The left of social democracy and the, the radical communists and, 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 and radical socialists further to the left, I think, had a proposed solution too, to go further, to socialize more, not to concede and retreat. Um, but if anything, I came across with less, not respect, but less, um, belief that there was kind of a status quo solution to the, to the crisis in these countries. So that's what I got from, from the history, kind of thinking about how we potentially can go from here to there. And I think in a country like the US, um, we have to imagine that if we can't put things like Medicare for all on the table, if we can't put things like the, a jobs guarantee on the table, if we can't restore union density, if we can't do things like that, you know, how are we gonna put more radical questions of the worker ownership of the means control on the table? That being said, I don't think that that's just a, like, uh, a fantastical ideological thing. I think, in fact, if we're to make what's good in social democracy sustainable, we need to find a way to take away from capitalists the power to withhold investment. So in other words, even if we just want to be good social democrats, we would have to be anti-capitalist. And I think the logic of our, of our res resolved kind of serious social democratic stance would take us into democratic socialism. But that particular wager that the third way made about giving up workers' power to the capitalists to give them flexibility so that prosperity would rain down on everyone, that, that turned out not to work very well in the long run. Yeah, world. it didn't work politically. So technically, I think it, it was working, but obviously in the process, they undermined their own social base. So why in the world would a worker vote for a center-left neoliberal labor party when, you know, if you really wanted to vote for a neoliberal party, you might as well get the real thing? Right. Um, and, and how do you then, when you now have diminished and weaker uh, working class institutions and, and in civil society, everything's hollowed out, uh, what happens now when there's threats from right populists? What happens when there's anti-immigrant sentiments? Uh, you're unable to really defend defend yourself and all these these old notions of class organization class solidarity falls to the wayside so yes it was a political you know complete f political failure in the in the long run so how do we win now so uh, uh, well that's the name of the last chapter of his book how we win I didn't say now so <laughs> <laughs> the long now well, I think that, that there's something interesting happening with Sanders and Corbyn and people around them. And I try to classify them a little bit differently. Um, you know, I call, let's say, Corbyn, uh, Sanders to some degree too, a class struggle social democrat. By that I mean that when I think about a lot of the valid left criticism of social democracy in the 1950s and the 1960s, it was that essentially social democrats were taking this raw energy, this organization, these demands out of the working class and funneling it in such a way that it was 
It was funneling it just to, to electoral ends. Mm -hmm. It was wedding working class people with, with in many cases, a, a broader imperial project. So if you look at the Labour Party stance on Vietnam and, and other, other things, it's quite, quite terrible. Um, in, in Sweden, though, uh, you know, Olaf Palma and the SAP were strong defenders of um, the anti-apartheid movement and also, uh, you know, butted heads with the US and, and Vietnam. So the, the record is mixed. But, but essentially, today, what Corbyn represents is completely antithetical to the to the pro imperial project and NATO uh, the NATO project. If you want proof, I'm sure someone maybe to speak me on that. You could see that British paratroopers are literally printing out uh, targets targets of him with his face on it. And there's lots of there's there's a video that, that circulated about them actually shooting using his his face as target practice. Um, uniformed uh, British British uh, paratroopers. Uh, and then of course. Corbyn and Sanders are generating crash, cash struck on a period of historic working class defeat. In the United States, you could say we actually really did make history as a political movement, as a left and, and as a, in a broader uh, working class movement in that in the history of capitalism, there had never been a working class so deeply depoliticized, so deeply defeated as, as the US movement in most of our, our, our lifetimes. So, is Sanders really co-opting energy? Is he co-opting energy and sheepdogging people in the Democratic Party or into parliamentarist electoral forms of organizing? No, he's generating energy, he's generating enthusiasm behind a set of demands that's rooted fundamentally around class struggle. So it's not just you and me need to sit at the table with capital, so it's gonna be labor, capital, and the state, and we're gonna make a fair bargain for workers. Uh, we need more accountable capitalism, we need better rules, or whatever else. No, his message is, you work hard and you deserve more. And the reason why you're not getting enough is because millionaires and billionaires are taking your piece of the pie. It's not because of immigrants, it's not because of minorities. That's his message. It's a, it's a message built around an antagonism, a polarization. Does it go far enough? No, but it's a starting point. And I think, I think we use that opening and we use the fact that working people are, are open to the idea that it's not their fault and those collective solutions problem. There's huge support for Medicare for all, for jobs guarantee, for all these other basic a basic things that we could campaign um, around. Even on, on, on other issues, uh, Trump has made the border wall and, and xenophobia his, his, his linchpin of everything he's been saying. He's had the bi biggest bully pulpit in the country for the last four years. But if you look at polling of, of what Americans think about the border wall, it's still only 30 something percent are, are in favor of it. If you look at the way people perceive immigrants, still the majority of Americans think that immigrants contribute more than they take away. It's far better than, than the polling was in the, the, the 90s. So I think there's, there's fertile ground for us to build a, a movement that's in the interest of ordinary people that people can rally around. I think the opening right now is through the, uh, these electoral efforts that can then be used to galvanize other things in civil society. It's not the way I would map it out in the abstract. You know, the classic socialist route, if you ask me at any point other than the last couple of years, what, what, what the route to change is, you know, you, you build at, at the local level, you rebuild a militant rank and file driven labor movement, you create little cadres of socialists and you influence local campaigns, you join your tenants union, you do all these things to create networks and just webs of dissent. And then we run electoral campaigns, which will demonstrate our strength. It's almost like a litmus test that generates, uh, demonstrates our, t our, our strength. This is the way the left has traditionally seen these campaigns. In our era, for whatever reason, it seems to be that everything is so hollowed out, we're making mass progress and we're skipping steps just through these electoral campaigns. The point now is to make sure the movements and the infrastructure, the grassroots can keep up because uh, you know Sanders, um, his campaign will be over soon. Uh, these. Uh, new crop of left-wing politicians I'm very, very excited about, but without a mobilized base keeping them honest, a lot of them will naturally gravitate towards the Democratic Party. We we'll only have to look at the, the crop of, of in many times quite left-wing uh, first wave of black mayors and local elected officials in the 70s, 80s and see what happens to them. David Dinkins was actually a DSA member uh, and, and was close to, to Harrington. Harold Washington, uh, who had a better better record in office was was supported by a lot of these these left groups and had to fight a machine to get elected, but still not because of their personal failings, but because of you know broader broader pressures, they became entrenched in the democratic um, establishment. So I think we need to 
figure out how to, how to use this opening to build an independent left? I think this is a good time to take questions from the audience, but I think I'll ask one first, which is, this seems to be a time when all over the world, traditional political parties are collapsing. They're offering people almost nothing, and most people realize it. Uh, the attempt to deal with it in a lot of places has just been to increase repression. But the notion of ever uh, uh, gaining legitimacy or legitimating from above seems to have even disappeared from the playbook. Uh, uh, things can change so quickly in terms of what seems to have looked like a strong party can suddenly mm -hmm. fall apart. Preparing for that world and the increased kind of social and class struggle, how do we make sure that we're not tying ourselves to a, uh, an entity that is going to be quickly off the map and that we're, we're faced with a socialism or barbarism choice that people had in the 30s? Well, I think in, in other countries, um, a different set of rules and, and lessons apply. So, for example, if we were in, in Europe, there's a bunch of old nostrums from the, um, from the late 19th century that I still think apply. Don't be a junior partner in a bourgeois coalition. So in other words, don't just go into a coalition government where you have no control over it and you're essentially responsible for austerity that's administered. Um, you know, that's a lesson in Italy with Rifondazione joined a, a, a pretty neoliberal pro, first a prote government. And then when later on an anti-establishment space opened up in Italy, it was monopolized by the populist right. So there was that lesson there. So, so in general, I mean, I think this is the reason why uh, there's, there's a call in most situations to, to form these new left-wing parties or support existing far-left parties and wait for the establishment parties to collapse and, and, and fill that void. Like Podemos tried and, and was moderately successful in Spain, like Syriza, we could talk about how badly they did when they, they were given the opportunity to govern, but, but Syriza was able to do in, in, in Greece and whatever else. I think in the UK, the situation is a little bit different because of the nature of their first-past-the-post system and the fact there were still these mechanisms at the grassroots through constituency labor parties and whatnot, where the labor party maybe can actually be captured and turn from what Lenin used to call the labor party, a bourgeois workers' party, into a like actual uh, workers' party. And in many ways, at least as far as its leadership, the labor party is the most left-wing major party in in um, in. Uh, Europe. I think it's to the left of, of Podemos, it's to the left of Die Linke, as far as it's, it's well, I'm really just talking about three people, but they're, they're very good, um, <laughs> especially John McDonald, Jack of a Lifetime subscriber. Um, but uh, I'm, easily, I'm easily bought one over. Um, so, but in the case of the United States, I would say we have to say that our, we face a unique set of circumstances based on the structure of our political system. And it sounds like American exceptionalism, but I'm not saying that the exceptionalism is culturally rooted. I'm saying that the exceptionalism is inherited to us by, by accidents of, of, of history. Um, I think the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are so diffuse that in many ways it's hard for them to collapse because they're basically just ballot lines. It's, it's impossible, I think, for socialists to really take it over because it's not clear what we would take over. Um, in a sense, the fact that there are like a thousand nodes of, part, uh, of, of power in the party make it, make it very difficult to, to both take over, but also I think makes it extremely uh, resilient. In the abstract, of course, I believe that we need a party that represents the interests of the majority class. And, and our interests are distinct from the interests of people who, who own and control things in society. And the Democratic Party is really, it was, even from the New Deal onward, it was a party of big oil. You know, the, the big oil was, was, was fine with, with, the, with the New Deal, and there's just uh, actually technical reasons why uh, it's capital intensive technology, right? So we, you're, you're more apt to be able to handle militant wage demands, where southern textile owners would be crippled potentially by a doubling of the wage. Uh, oil industry could, could make it work. But, but from the 30s to the 80s, it was, it was big oil, and then afterwards now with finance, real estate, uh, trial lawyers, all these, uh, now Silicon Valley, the Tari Democrats, they're all in the camp of the, the Democratic Party. So obviously, 
we need we need a party of our of our own. But I don't actually think that the party system in the U.S. is going to collapse by itself. I think the method that we need to do is we need to try to create the first real party in U.S. modern U.S. history, which means I think running often in democratic primaries, but we're running people who are self-described socialists who are committed to the same kind of ten-point program, who are at least somewhat disciplined by membership organization that caucus together. Uh, there could be some, 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 they might be able to vote freely on most issues, but on, on key matters and key concerns that, that, uh, that the party or the, the organization has legislated, you know, has, has thought about programmatically, they would, they would have to vote in unison. Essentially creating the shell of a party inside and outside the Democratic Party, um, I, th I think is, is the correct route now, but I don't anticipate a, a collapse of the, the Democratic uh, Party. Yeah, Jason. Um, so I had a question about uh, <clears throat> about uh, uh, you said a two-part question about um, I, I'll, I'll start with just uh, anarchism and uh, communism, by which I mean like ultra-left communism. So uh, so I'm just curious. Um, okay, like in some ways I think that uh, in, in some ways I think that that socialism. Uh, even if you're a, a communist, and, and uh, even if you're a left communist, and, and many anarchists are, are fine with sort of thinking about it this way too, uh, but if you're a left communist or an anarchist, uh, uh, socialism is supposed to be sort of like a like a midway point between liberalism and and, and full communism, right? So, um, so I guess my question is basically like. Uh, uh, if it's if we're seeing it, uh, if we see that as as a, as a midway point, uh, in in that sense, I don't necessarily think that, that you necessarily do. Maybe maybe you do, maybe you don't. But um, how 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 could this be framed in such a way? Uh, how could the concerns of say DSA and Jacobin be framed and organized or deployed in such a way as to um, uh, to to sort of like retain the interest and the allegiance of uh, of, of anarchists and left communists, despite the fact that they might see it as being too moderate uh, in, in whatever way. I, I mean, I, I'm asking because um, the way I see myself as, uh, is, is a, as an imminent communist, and by, by which I mean wherever we happen to be in a given moment, materially speaking, I want to go as far as, po as, far as possible to directly, <coughs> towards directly democratic communism. And, um, and in my opinion, right now, that's DSA and Jacobin. So, so for me personally, even though I would subscribe to, uh, you know, a, a, a basically a council communist or, or ultra left communist position, uh, I still think that this is the correct uh, position for where we're at at this particular moment. Um, so I'm just curious mm -hmm. if you see that as uh, as as an important part of. Um, you know, not because I want to like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Uh, maybe we'll take three. Does that make sense? Sure. Right, let's let's take three. Let's take three questions. Ja Jacob. Um, yeah. So you laid out this sort of party strategy of this inside outside. Um, it kind of sounded like if DSA had democratic centralism. Um, it's <laughs> what that is what I got from that. Um, I'm curious. Uh, how you see that being accomplished, if you see that being accomplished in the next several years, um, how, how do you propose we go about building that? One more. Steve. Uh, yeah. Um, you talked about the need to take away the, the power of capital over investment decisions. How can we, how can we do that uh, without dismantling the repressive apparatus of the state? Um, it seems, it seems that the, the capitalists will want to maintain that control and they'll use their state to do it. The state is not a neutral body, but it's run for and mostly by capitalists. So how, how do you get around that dilemma? Um, what kind of, do you, need, do you need a revolution in the sense of dismantling the state? Yeah, good question. Uh, that's great. Uh, those are all uh, deep cuts, but I'll, I'll <laughs> uh, you know, I'm more of like a, like you know, a light, you know, a jovial uh, leftist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, you don't go to a Ja Rule con uh, concert and expect him to like rap, right? You, you want him to sing on the hook. 
Um, so, uh, now, now, when it comes to uh, anarch anarchism, communism, other parts of the left, um, yeah, I guess I would say my, my goal is a society in which the state is so radically transformed, it's not repressive, and it, you don't, you, you can't even, it has a different class character, and you, you, it doesn't even, it, it barely, uh, you know, it has barely any recognition to the state you have today. So in that sense, you know, I guess I share a lot of the, the vision of anarchism, or at the very least, the idea that, that we need as little hierarchy as possible. We need all, any hierarchy, that, any residual hierarchy that might be necessary in a complex society with a complex division of labor to be democratically accountable. And, and I, guess, I guess I see it as an horizon. Um, now, as a practical movement, I think that's where uh, anarchism and council communism and others have, have traditionally failed. I think the left used to have to relate to it very seriously because um, like anarchism represents, represented a wing of the workers' movement, right? Syndicalism was really a, a natural outcropping, uh, for example, of, of these, these struggles of the working class of, of, in places like Chicago, Seattle, other places with very strong wings. In certain countries, like in Spain and in Cuba, at least, uh, it was in many ways the dominant wing of the, the, the workers' uh, movement. Um, and often, you know, later faced the, the brunt of repression from, uh, from socialists. Today, it seems to me a body of thought that doesn't really have um, a base. And I think if it does reemerge in some form, uh, then I think we would have to relate to it. I think for now, we should welcome anyone into organizations like DSA that is willing to, to fight with us for day-to-day -day reforms. And I think often, the, let's say the question of reformism or not, it's like our question today is how are you fighting for these reforms? Are you fighting for reforms through class struggle? Or are you fighting for reforms through seeking um, compromise and mediation with the state or mediation with, um, with uh, businesses or, or whatnot? So if you're fighting for rank and file democracy in your unions, if you're fighting for uh, ra helping to raise the level of class, class consciousness in day-to-day -day struggles, then I think we're, we're completely on the same page today. And maybe if we're lucky, someday in the future, these questions will be uh, actually you know, re relevant. Um, oh. Yeah, I guess in the long term, I think that um, I don't see an alternative to having a mass membership party that has, um, in the original meaning of the word, some sort of democratic centralist um, um, thing. I don't think we. I think the word has been kind of tainted, and we need we need to think seriously about why bureaucracies have emerged. Uh, you know, unaccountable bureaucracies have emerged in kind of these these attempts. But what democratic centralism means in its its essence is kind of. Uh, Full freedom of discussion, but unity in action. And I and I think that at least in theory, if you have a small group of socialists, the organization would have to figure out a way to democratically decide upon priorities of an act uh, together. In practice, often um, the unity in action part uh, tends to trample out the freedom of discussion uh, part. Um, but at the very least, I think we need a loose version of that where we say there are certain unified principles that are democratically decided that we can't deviate from. But besides for that, you're free to do as you, as you will. And I, I think, especially when it comes to elected officials, they're getting funding from a future left-wing organization. If they're getting volunteers and support and we're getting them elected, then they need to be accountable uh, to that. It needs to be accountable to that organization and a broad set of ideas. That being said, you encounter a very similar dynamic to potential problems like dual unionism on this, in that a working class representative needs to be accountable to both their constituents too, not just to uh, some sort of uh, central committee or national political committee somewhere else. So how do you balance those concerns? What happens if you have great militant trade union leaders and they're members of, of this future socialist party, let's say, but uh, they're, and they're like good trade union leaders committed to work a rank and file democracy, but the rank and file and their locals decide to endorse as a lesser evil a democratic candidate in an election. Let's say not a bad democrat, but like a you know, center, center left democrat instead of a, a socialist candidate that's maybe polling 5, 10 percent. Uh, what, what do those leaders do? Are they, are they told you, have, you can't canvas or you can't campaign or speak on behalf of this 
this Democrat that your membership just, just elected to, to support? Or are they told you have to go on the campaign trail for the socialist candidate? Like, what, 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 these tensions will, will arise and we have to resolve. And actually, the example I gave wasn't completely made up. It's very similar to dynamics that happened in 1936 in the Socialist Party, where the uh, Ruther brothers in UAW, back when they were more left wing, were committed socialists, but they were part of unions and, and leaders, leading the leadership of a union that, that supported Roosevelt and not, uh, not, not Norm Thomas. Uh, in a way, communists were, were better able to navigate that, that um, you know, this, this dilemma. Uh, than the Socialist Party uh, it happens. Was. It happened in Seattle about a year and a half ago in the city council elections, where there was a socialist running, which DSA, DSA supported, and a, a union-supported candidate, and there was, and the union-supported candidate won. Yep. So, um, so yeah, it's my vision, though, is some sort of party, some sort of way to coordinate activity, but one that makes it, uh, is a party in the truest sense, it's rooted in, in uh, working class communities, it's not a separate thing. And my, my ideal world, today we, we talk naturally of the labor movement, uh, socialist, uh, groups, ideological socialists, social movements, like they're separate things. I think when the left is really strong, you, you can talk about those things as one and the same. And uh, their activity is coordinated, but in a way that doesn't trample democracy, but actually makes it easier for people to actually participate meaningfully in political struggles. So today, if you're Let's say someone who's inspired by Bernie Sanders and angry about inequity in your in your um, your where you live, um, and you hear about DSA, and let's say you're a 43 year old nurse, do you think that person would feel comfortable just going to a DSA meeting, or will they feel like they don't know the language, they don't know people, they don't know how to meaningfully contribute if they only have three four hours a week to contribute? And I think that's the test, and that's a big dilemma of DSA, um, and. I think it's after a fact of being a largely middle class organization is that it's largely a uh, white organization. But it's, the core thing is this, this, um, this disconnect. And there's different ways to approach it. Uh, one would be to just sit around and, and form little struggle sessions and lament the fact that DSA is like um, too middle class or too whatever. The other way is to figure out ways to, to build these things and actually make it so that the organization is more democratic, therefore it needs meetings and other stuff, but also um, accessible, and I, I think a lot of that uh, is probably going to be solved by by having leaders committed to uh, to making the organization more accessible. Probably be solved through through language. It'll probably be solved with just conditions changing on the outside. Uh, but I think in the long run, it'll uh, we'll we'll have to strive not for necessarily a socialist party, but for a working class rooted party in which there'll be a large contingent of socialists, and hopefully over time. Um, it'll be a, a socialist working class party. In the U.S., I, uh, if I had to guess, we'll get something a lot more confusing and more diffuse, some sort of like left populist -y, like Podemos thing, uh, which I, I, as a doctrinaire uh, socialist, wouldn't be pleased by, but it'll be better than, than nothing. And, uh, but I, it, seems, it seems like to me like Podemos better suits the temperament and the language of, of historically in the U.S. than it does Spain, where they actually have a really deep tradition of, of the, the left. Um, and I guess on the, the last question was, uh, okay, the question of, I guess, re uh, revolution and change and whatever else. I think the model is you um, legislate reforms that increase the power of workers and decrease the power of capital. Um, and you try to legislate about and win a democratic mandate for uh, worker ownership, worker control, and further deeper socializations. Uh, if I had to guess, at least in the, the countries where this happened first, uh, capitalists will kind of uh, break the mandate in various ways, um, including using the, re the uh, repressive apparatus of the state. But more generally, I think the real weapon is um, capital flight, disinvestment, sabotage, and things like that. Uh, but if you have the democratic mandate, then you have the mandate to tell people who voted for this thing, show up in the streets, demand justice, uh, demand that that, that you know, local military and local civil servants stand by the elected government. Um, you know, in, in many ways, I think this is the, the model. So I think uh, it's still a rupture. There's still something like that. But, but we need to approach it as if it's, it's going to be a, sm a smooth road and then, and then be prepared to defend our, our democratic mandate. But that seems like 
an issue for uh, further along uh, the road. But I think the key is just to maintain the principle of we want a society in which uh, life outcomes aren't the result of accidents of birth. We want a society that guarantees certain necessities, and we want a broader economic system that sustains this, this welfare state, sustains these guarantees, and sets, set, instead of fights against it. That logic puts us into confrontation with, with capital. You know, it'd be a lot easier if, if we didn't have to do it that way, but we do. Score questions. <laughs> yeah. Brenda. Hey, uh, just want to congratulate you on your new book, uh, The Tales. I know you said that your publisher helped you with it, but. They, they named it actually, but yeah. <laughs> but it's just, uh, very evocative to me. It, yeah, it's good. It says to me, like, I just think the communist disdain to conceal their views and aims. Uh, we declare that our ends can only be achieved by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Uh, uh, I will tell the Hachette marketing department that, 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 that that's what they were talking about. No, but thank you, I do, I do appreciate it. But uh, that being said, um, you know, I, I do find your argument fairly compelling regarding sort of uh, semi demsent organization within the Democratic Party. Uh, I'm extremely <coughs> skeptical of such an idea just because I, I find like not only like the Democrats, but also the Republicans, I feel we have a very severely ossified system in the United States where uh, it's completely cheated towards two-party, like you were saying, like we don't have like sort of first-past-the-post or like parliamentary democracy type systems. It's a very controlled system in the United States. But that being said, um, I also want to talk more about, like you were saying, the different nodes of power within the, the Democrats and the, and, and the the possibilities of recoup recuperation and sub sub subsumption into the democratic regime just on the basis of, you know, growing up. I know a lot of the immigrant rights activists that I was working with um, ended up getting jobs with labor unions. Um, you're just talking about the democratic machine is a massive organization that offers um, jobs, benefits, and um, training that, you know, we don't have anything near the capacity for. And I'm wondering how do we prevent that recuperative power from taking over our most militant actors um, yep. within yep. our organizations? Should we take one more? Or? Yeah. Okay. No, there's no one. Uh, is there? Did uh, I, okay, sorry. Uh, um, so let's imagine uh, Bernie wins. Uh, you have uh, right now this energy, this swell of membership in BSA, support for the Bernie candidacy. Uh, how do you maintain that energy moving forward through the presidency, through basically what are going to be a series of struggles uh, to push uh, policies that are completely unacceptable to the Democratic Party? Yeah, so I think on the first question, I wasn't actually advocating creating something within the Democratic Party so much as just noting that, that a lot of what we talk about when we talk about the Democratic Party is we're talking about a ballot line. And a lot of when we talk about a third party, we're talking about the struggles to establish a new ballot line and to uh, maintain access to that ballot line. Whereas a, my, a more useful, route, uh, I think, use of our time might be to figure out how do we bring together candidates, unite them, whether they're running as independents, Democrats, or even theoretically Republicans or you know Greens, um, and hold them to a common uh, program and also have them be identified in a way that that is distinct from the way regular Democrats are identified with. You know, people don't, even someone like AOC, who's, who's pretty free-floating as, as far as not being, you know, more being a justice Democrat you know, candidate than a DSA, one <coughs> is identified by most of the American public as a socialist, as someone who's butting heads with Nancy Pelosi and, and other people. And I think that's, that's important because we can't go to people and say, we do want to disaggregate the base of the Democratic Party, or at least people voting for them let's say black and brown people voting for Democrats because they know that they have the most to lose if, if Republicans are, are elected. Um, we can't go to these people and say, um, you know, you're stupid, vote, you know, break, what's the old line? So like the rhyming thing, you know, um, uh, like no, no, no to the elephant, no to the ass, build a party of the working class. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, but what we can do is say, listen, you're, you have these concerns and you believe in defending Social Security and you believe in expanding, uh, believe in Medicare for all, you believe in all these other things, but the people you're supporting 
won't won't do that for you. Uh, you should support Bernie Sanders. You should support AOC. You should support these this new crop of, of people. They better represent the things that you want. There there are people that that are are actually uh, in sync with your your interests. Uh, it seems like an easier easier starting um, starting point. Um, so what is the Democratic Party? How do they discipline candidates? You know, one way is obviously uh, funding and and things like things like that. So we have to create alternative bases of of funding. But we also have to give candidates something else too, which is volunteers and people to knock on doors and, and things like that. And I actually think that a committed political movement can actually do that a lot better than you know how they generate their volunteers, because it's often quite quite pathetic how they have to try to entice people to knocking on doors for these bland, you know, kind of interchangeable democratic um, you know candidates. So one reason why sixty thousand people in DSA can make such a big media kind of splash and also make such a big impact in different areas is because civil society is so hollowed out. Unions are, 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 are less capable of mobilization than ever. Uh, churches and other civic institutions that used to be able to mobilize people really don't anymore. So small groups of coordinated people can actually uh, make, a, make a big, uh, big uh, uh, difference. But fundamentally, the reason why uh, labor unions, let's say, bureaucratize or people in the Democratic Party become co-opted is because of the structure and nature of capitalism itself. So, you know, labor and capital relate, are dependent on each other, but it's an asymmetrical dependency. You will always need your job and therefore your employer more than your employer will need you as an individual worker. And collective action is often not rational for people. It's more rational if you have a shitty situation at work and your, your hours are being cut by, by a quarter. It's more rational to keep your head down, to ask for uh, a little bit of help from your family and friends, or maybe to pick up a shift or two you know, in, in you know, driving a lift or something. That's more rational than fighting back and risking your, your job, especially if unemployment's high, especially if, if it's hard to find jobs or whatnot. Um, I mean, the role of socialists, I think, is to create the infrastructure of the dissent they can make collective action more rational. And I think in certain instances, we have done that. You know, Create the, the infrastructure set that make it more rational for people to turn to each other and see their problems as being political, not personal failings and, and things like that. But, but it's that dependency that leads trade unions to compromise. It's after a wave of struggle, people getting exhausted, not wanting to continue to, to go to meetings, that leads to the creation of bureaucracies. Uh, and creation of a layer of, of unionized staff that op occupy a kind of an intermediary position in the, uh, I hate the word dialectic, but I'll just say because I'm getting tired, <laughs> labor capital you know, dialectic. Um, it, it's, that, it, it's the fact that in order to fund social <clears throat> programs and fund the state, you need a favorable business environment and profitable firms that you could tax that causes politicians to pander to the interests of, of big corporations. It isn't money in politics, you know. It's like it, it's it's the fact that that the society runs if, if these corporations are, are 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 you know are performing you know well. So I, I think there's these deeper questions to to overcome, but it's 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 not as simple as, as just regular you know co-option. But we, we can I think create militant unions. We can create these 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 groups of people that can can push against some of these things, and build new alternative. Uh, structures, but ultimately we'll do it by fighting capital, not by kind of creating spaces within the Democratic Party or whatnot. Um, with the last question, I think if Bernie is in power, uh, we have to remember that we're not in in power. Um, in that, I think the role of the left would still would be at that point to be kind of a at best to provide critical support, but we would have to frame it in such a way it says. Bernie wants us on the streets, Bernie wants us forming unions, Bernie wants us doing all this, this stuff, and we're going to help Bernie uh, from the outside. And regardless of whether Bernie attacks to the right when he's in power and, and, and capitulates these pressures, or regardless of whether he attacks to the left, that has to be our, our, um, our approach. And... Um, to help Bernie with that framing of that? Well, I think, I think so, yeah. I think, I think we, we would say that you know, we are doing this thing on the outside because it gives uh, Bernie and, and the 15 or 20 people in Congress that don't hate him, it'll probably be a little bit less than that. Um, it'll give them the space to, to, make, uh, to make demands and to say to Capitol, yes, you're right that we need you, but um, 
the potential disruption if you don't agree to this legislation is going to be greater, so you might as well you know agree to it. Um, I think I think that's that's our nature. And when when he's not able to get anything passed, or when there's more obstruction, he uses the bully pulpit of the presidency to explain. Here are the people who are obstructing us. Here's the resistance we're facing, and 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 you know we use the the office not dissimilar to how even someone like Trump uses it um, when he you know can't get things passed beyond the the regular um, kind of generic Republican um, you know uh, tax cut and and repression agenda, but um, you know I, I think that that we need to um, I guess not assume that this is the, the end point, but also not assume that we have an a, a, a actual mass base that's to the left of Bernie. Uh, so we need to find a way to use the, the mandate of Bernie Sanders to keep pushing people to the left and keep pushing people to, uh, to confrontation in some, um, in some way. And we'll see where that goes. But San, a Sanders administration would, to transport it to a parliamentary system, because uh, it's sometimes easier to think about left politics in the context of countries that have actually had, you know, at the national level, large left, left parties. It would be like an extreme minority government, where Sanders is the prime minister, but he only has the support of like 15, 20 people, and to get anything passed, he needs his, his coalition partners, you know, mainstream Democrats, to, to get things passed, and that waters everything down. So it's gonna be like a messy, divided, thing, an extreme minority government, and we wouldn't expect an extreme minority government to get much passed. I think we shouldn't expect any future left government to, to, do, to necessarily be able to, unless we could create countervailing kind of pressure and, and energy from the, uh, from the outside. Good. Any more? Sounds out, like I'm, a good way I'm to... I'm out of water, so yeah. Sounds like <laughs> a good moment to start.